Okay, it's a Monday right here at Studio Kitchen, Colorado, the 25th of January. Where has the month gone? We are just cruising and rock and rolling. It is a beautiful day in the Mile High City, and why not? We got the gents from Culinary Quick Start in here. How's it going, Chef Blake Stein? Fantastic. How are you? Good to see you, Chef Marcus Ng. So far, so great. Okay, good, man. This is going to be a great week. All right, as you know, we're making education cool once again, and you can get in on this. Go to themoderneater.com. Check out the tab that says Emily Griffith Culinary Quick Start, and you, too, can get this gimme course that we're going to talk about right now and have great, great guests, just like this gentleman right here. He's a friend of ours. He's a great guy. His name's Chef Justin Brunson, but he's the butcher as well. River Bear American Meats. Yeah. Woo! You ready for some I'm, charcuterie? I'm always ready for some charcuterie, man. Cured meats is my thing. That's what I do. Okay, so we're going to give you a taste of what's going to happen in the class this Thursday night. You can't attend it, but coming up, there will be another cycle of classes, and you'll have great guests just like this while you're going to school. We'll tell you more information about that, but I'm going to let you guys just take it away. Talk to Justin about what you would talk about on that Thursday night. I'm going to go over here and be a student. Fantastic. Sounds great. It's right. the worst student you've ever had. Uh, I'm not <laughs> bad. I listen. I ask a lot of dumb questions, he's a that's squirty, for sure. But he's got good questions. He shows up on time. <laughs> he's here every time. Um, well, welcome, Chef. Awesome. Thank, you. Thank you so much for coming to join us. Yeah, no problem. Uh, and I know you've, got, you've gained a lot of uh, notoriety around this town for some very high-quality cured meats. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's start with uh, what, what is a cured meat? Like, how would we treat our students? <sighs> Uh, questions when they ask you, you know, what's, what's the difference between a cured meat and a raw meat? Well, cured meats um, are usually cured and dried. Um, there's two really categories. There's whole muscle, like this copa that we have over here. And then there's ground ferment, like these salamis that we have over here. But uh, I think the big thing is, uh, you know, when you start talking about cured meats is, is how they came along. Um, of course, they came along to uh, preserve food. It's actually a food preservation method. Um, you know, salt, once people figured out about, you know, f there was fire, and then they figured about salt, and they're like, wow, we put this salt on this product and hang it in this cave. We can come back later in the year, and this is still good to eat. The, the meat's not spoiled. It even tastes a little bit better yeah, that time around, Yeah, it even tastes a it? little bit better, right? <laughs> it's funny to think that this, uh, like, one of the most artesian things in the whole world came out of just needing to preserve food to get through the hot season. Um, that's why I think charcuterie is one of the coolest things, or dry cured meats is one of the coolest things. I like to call them dry cured meats because nobody likes to say charcuterie. I wanted to ask that question, the first dumb question. Is, what does the term charcuterie mean? Is it a term? Is it just so a it word? is a term. So charcuterie is, it, it is sausage, fresh sausage making, ba bacon making, dry cured salami, dry cured. So it is, the, it is really the act of of a grinding or taking a whole mussel and salting and turning it into something. It could be bacon, fresh sausage, pate, salamis. So that is charcuterie. So everything is in, under charcuterie. So when you see all of these other accoutrements along with that on the charcuterie board, yes, it, the, it's just referring to the meats. The these are all the just accoutrements okay. to our charcuterie. <laughs> Oftentimes, I think on charcuterie boards, you see a lot of pickles, some sweet things, yeah. some spicy things, nuts, fresh fruits, crackers, things of that nature. You can really make a really nice spread out yeah. of uh, out of all of these things put together here. On one a place. lot of stuff, if you think about it, this is all real salty and fatty. So you're just looking for balance, uh, really clean balance. So I eat a bunch of copa. You know, my mouth gets covered in fat and like... So what am I going to do to put in my mouth next to clean that fat up? So I personally like something acidic like an olive or even something kind of plain and crunchy like a, a cracker or a piece of bread uh, or a nut, something like that. It, it's just uh, you're cleansing your palate and then going in for another round to have a full another experience. And it's crazy. One of my favorite things about charcuterie boards is like all the different, like look at these ingredients. There's probably five, six, maybe even a thousand different combinations you can have in your mouth at one time with what's <laughs> on this table, right? Like, it's so cool to me. It's like, I mean, and you're like, oh, well, I'll try this with this and a little bit of this. And it's, it's just so, it's such a fun way to uh, dine. I mean, to me, this is dinner at my house for me once a week. I love cheese. I love meat. Uh, I love accoutrement that goes with it as well. So <laughs> this and red wine or white wine. Or beer or whiskey, really anything. You could have a pretty well balanced diet eating just charcuterie yeah, all day long. Yeah, my gout wouldn't like it very much, <laughs> but I, I sure would. 
Do you, uh, so would you need to be a, a scientist to be able to create cured meats? Um, no, not at all. I mean, there are some definitely some rules that you need to follow using the right amounts of salt and cure and temperatures. But I mean, I taught myself how to do this and I don't have a college education. So um, I think it's just one of those things. It's, you know, learn about it, educate yourself, um, and then uh, be the first person to try your own product. What's the uh, <laughs> general ratio for like salt to meat? Um, so... so it's funny. So I live in a USDA world, which is different. So the USDA makes me, on my home also makes me use three and a half percent salt. Uh, Pre-USDA, I was at two and a half percent salt. Um, so it, I mean, I, I, it's all about doing it so it's safe, you know. Um, I always like to push the lowest salt limits that I possibly could because I really want to taste the pork first. Uh -huh. Do you get pork. better lacto-fermentation with a lower salt content? Um... So really with the, with the fermentation process that goes on with these, we're adding starter cultures to these. So it doesn't matter if it's higher or it's lower. It is in there. Mm -hmm. As long as you are in your fermentation in the right, um, in the right temperature and humidity, you're going to get that growth now. And how do you inoculate that? Uh, so we use a starter culture um, <clears throat> from Char Hansen. Uh, it's a lactobillus, just like th that's in beer. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the same. The lactobillus is the same... Um, it starts the same fermentation in this as it does like a, even a Pilsner. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty cool. That's awesome. What about, a, so a lot of these things will be cased in mold. Uh, yes. Let's talk a little bit about good molds and bad molds. Yeah. Um, so penicillum is the good mold. My whole room, if, you, if we'd go to River Bear, the whole room is just covered in white mold. And we inoculate some of the stuff like these when they go through the, their fermentation step. There's a, a product called Mold 600 that we use on the outside of these. Um, but the whole muscle stuff, we actually just roll the carts into the room, and there's so much flora of that mold that it just grows. <laughs> That's amazing. It's pretty – it's fun. I should do this. I should take a one, two, three, four, five day of it and, like, post them next to each other because something that goes in there that looks like this or like this in five days will be white and powdery on the outside. Um, another thing that we do – with all of our whole muscle. So we actually encase all this stuff. Um, here, I'm gonna take a look at this. So this is how the product looks more like in the room. See, there's a casing on this. Um, and these get a natural casing too. They're both natural casings. And that helps the product dry a little slower and protects it and it gives the, something, the mold something to grow on that you can actually take off which is pretty cool. Makes cleaning it up a lot easier, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah it does. Um, it's a lot more labor on our end because we have to hand scrub all that mold off. Uh, so this is probably one of the most laborious projects that you can do. I mean, so we, we get the meat in, we hand trim it all, we grind it all, we mix the seasoning into it, we stuff it, we tie it, we hang it. It, it goes through fermentation, it goes through drying, it comes out of drying, we hand scrub all the mold off each piece, and then into the packaging machine, into this black paper by hand. It's like wrapping Christmas presents all day. <laughs> and then the sticker goes on there by hand. And that's like, people are like, wow, that's an expensive product. And I'm like, well, look what goes into it. Like, mm -hmm. There's a lot of love going into lot that of, stuff. A lot of love. This creates a lot of jobs in Denver. Right? <laughs> yeah, so that's a, it's a very laborious pro uh, process. Uh, it takes a lot of time. I mean, these guys, these little guys, these retail size take about six to eight weeks to dry. Uh, these take four to six months to dry. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So just the square foot that it takes up, the amount of, the amount of area that it takes to make and dry and the inventory uh, is pretty insane to uh, get into this. Yes, sir. Uh, th this reminds me a lot of a distilling process, just to how much it goes into it. Yeah. But you talk about aging. Is the longer you age something, the better it'll taste, the, the more coveted it'll be. Uh, time. I'm, it, 100%. Yeah. No, 100%. So a lot of guys, a lot of guys rush their salamis. Uh, most, I, I know a lot of guys that do these in 21 days. Um, they're real soft and mushy. Like these are real hard and nice. Mm -hmm. I like my salami a little harder. I think the American palate likes her. Uh, salami a little harder. Um, that's why we do American cured meats. That's part of our whole thing is American cured meats. A lot of these flavors, like orange habanero, nobody's ever made an orange habanero salami before. It's pretty damn tasty, I yeah. gotta say. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, but we also do have some of these class, more classic flavors too. But you know, um, I like to let them go a little longer. Um, I mean, this guy right here is about six months old. 
What I like to do is take these whole pieces like this, vacuum seal them, mm -hmm. and then put them away. <laughs> and like, I'll pull them out like a year, two years, three years. That's when it starts to get real, real funky and real delicious. What got you into doing this? Um, <clears throat> well, I've always been a fat kid, and I've always liked meat a whole lot. Uh, you know, growing up in Iowa, hunting and fishing and just being around it. And then I started eating... I remember when I went to my first <clears throat> real Italian deli, and I started eating some of the cured meats, and I'm like, holy cow, this is not like the bologna, or this is not like <laughs> the ham we get back home, you know? So I just <laughs> fell in love with it. Uh, I think it's one of the most artesian things you can do. <clears throat> I love old world methods. Um, I mean, I taught myself how to do this in a garage in a kegerator. Nobody wow. was willing to teach me. I reached out to a bunch of people at that time. People were really holding that stuff close to themselves like oh there's no way i would let somebody come in and see our process you know <laughs> now i mean i'm a huge believer i've taught 20 people in denver how to do this you know so mm -hmm. to me it's like if we don't teach people this this is an art that will get lost yeah and i'll i even give my recipes away like i'm like here here's my recipe because it's going to taste way different when you make it than when i make it a lot of my flavor comes from the flora in my room um, so there's different molds and yeast that grow in my room that would grow in a room, say, in San Francisco or Chicago or New York. Um, so our flora has a lot to do with our flavor. What could taint a room? What? What could taint a room or bring oh, the flora off? I mean, just bad yeast, yeah. bad yeast strains, bad mold strains. Um, I think any of those things could definitely... Uh, Throw your product off. Pro yeah, or bring in rotten product. Let's do that this. Stuff. Um, building a board, I kind of think that that's an art itself. Absolutely. Yeah. You want me to go into it? Yeah, let's, let's hammer that. All right. So when I build a charcuterie board. You mind if we break? Yeah, we can Real break. quick? Yeah. Okay. We're going to break off. We'll come back from Studio Kitchen Colorado. Again, Emily Griffith Culinary Quick Start is what we're doing. I'll tell you what. This is a gimme. It's a free course. You also get... Um, Surf Safe certified, which is fantastic. Talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we go over a uh, particular Surf Safe, uh, definite do's and don'ts every night in class. We try to uh, make it as uh, cohesive to the questions that they're probably going to ask you on, on the food handler's exam. Also, when you sign up for this class and you attend and you participate, we pay for your Surf Safe to be done. Through Emily Griffith Tech College. So everything's free. Okay, and the course is three weeks long. We're doing it Monday through Thursday right here from Studio Kitchen Colorado. Again, it's a gimme. People pay a lot of money <laughs> just to watch this type of stuff online, and you can come participate in Studio Kitchen as well and see uh, great experts like Justin Brunson come in and just talk to you about their passion and, and their art. Again, themoderneater.com. There's a tab at the top. <coughs> it's Emily Griffith Culinary Quick Start. The next round of courses starts when? February 8th. February 8th. Don't snooze on this thing. It's filling up quickly. And again, uh, restaurants and, and operators as well, if you're looking for some great, talented people that want to get into the business or they're just sharpening their skills, there's also a form for you to sign up there as well. So we'll take a break from Studio Kitchen Colorado. We'll come right back. We're going to assemble this great charcuterie board right here in the kitchen with Chef Justin Brunson. We'll be back in a flash. The Modern Eater Show continues. Hey. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? This is Brother Luck from Lucky Dumpling, four by Brother Luck in Colorado Springs, and I am rocking with the Modern Eater. You're watching them, you're tasting them, you're knowing everything there is to know about Colorado. <laughs> Hi, Charlie from Brews Beers here. Our new Belgian Abbey Four Pack is a mixed package of the four core beers made in Abbey and Trappist breweries in Belgium. So we have a single, a double, a triple, and a quadruple in one package. Now, quadruples are the emperors of Belgian monastery ales. They're dark in color uh, with a dense tan head and alcohol ranging from 8 to 12 percent. So they're pretty strong. Quadruples are very rich and complex with big maltiness, uh, spice, and flavors of raisins, cherries, and plums. Alcohol is apparent in the mouthfeel, but not overwhelming. Uh, even at 10.5% ABV. So the finish is long, complex, and dry, and they're great beers anytime, by themselves or with hearty foods. Pick up your Abbey Four Pack at either Brews location, 67th and Pencos, or at Colfax in York, and at fine liquor stores throughout the Denver metro area. 
Take home some Belgian style badassery today. You're watching the modern eater, and now back to the show. Okay, welcome back to Studio Kitchen Colorado on a Monday fun day. And why not? Chef Justin Brunson's here in the kitchen with us. We're going to get back and assemble this great charcuterie board right here with the chef. But I have to tell you about Jeff Rourke and A-Plus Beverage Solutions. He's the man getting your tap systems ready and adding lines and doing build-outs for you. Getting ready to go, and your tap systems are important. Jeff Rourke, he's a family man, been in the business for over 20 years. He's the most trusted man when it comes to tap installations and maintenance. Give him a call, 720-272-3809. Jay, are you ready? If you're pouring in a fish and beer, what are you doing? You're pouring your money down the drain. Don't pour your money down the drain. Jeff Rourke, it's just a phone call away, 720-272-3809, and tell him the Modern Eater sent you. Okay, guys, Chef Marcus, Chef Blake, this is what we do when we're teaching, right? Or when you guys are. Absolutely. On this Thursday, Chef Brunson will be back with us. And um, I'm really, really learning a lot today. There's a lot to this and probably so much more. But River Bear American Meats, you can get these fine meats in a few places, but where I like to go is Lever's Locavore. Yeah, you can find us at Lever's Locavore, Tony's Markets, uh, Alfalfa's Markets, Lucky's Markets, our friends at Marzik's. Uh, you can find us wholesale through uh, What Chefs Want, Seattle's Fish Company, and Cheese Importers. I'll tell you what, we love to support local, and you do such a great job. Just the ambassador of this brand, River Bear American Meats. It's good stuff, man. Yeah. I love it's it. It's easy when you're the bear, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I guess it is. All right, I'm going back to my student position there. And again, themoderneater.com, and check out Emily Griffith Culinary Quick Start. Sign up. You can get going next month as well. Guys, take it away. All, All right. Awesome. Here we go. So we're, uh, we're going to put together a really nice looking charcuterie board here. Yeah. I think there's some things when you're building a charcuterie board. Um, I usually like to have some kind of whole muscle charcuterie, a ground ferment. If you think about these, they're fatty, they're salty. Um, so, you know, you need things to cleanse your palate. Uh, something acidic like an olive would be great or pickles, something like that. Um, I also like some sweet. Sweet stuff really goes really well with uh, our salumi uh, or charcuterie. Or salami or dry cured meats, all the same thing. Got a lot of names. <laughs> oh, yes. So meat with many different names. Um, so I always love Primo products. Uh, Vic's a local guy. He make, makes stuff that's actually about a half mile from here. Great flavors. He puts a lot of chilies and stuff in it. So it's acidic. It's sweet. Show that to the camera. So yeah. Shout out to Vic. Yo, Vic. Primo Jams. You can find these guys at Whole Foods. Um, and most of the cheese, the small cheese shops here in town carry it as well. I love it. Yeah. Um, so cheese, I like to have a little cheese. Uh, so we got a little truffle cheese. We got a little Cypress Grove. The lonely apple. Uh, What's Mendo. up with the apple? Is well, that... you know, just another thing that's, you know, it's uh, acidic and it yeah. cleanses your palate. You get a bunch of cheese or, you know, creamy stuff in your mouth. You take a nice bite off an apple. Mm -hmm. Very cl cleanses your palate very nicely. Grapes could go in there too. Grapes. Uh, any assortment of dried fruits. Uh, cherries, apricots, raisins. I mean, all that stuff works great. I always like a dolma because sometimes you have those people that don't eat meat and they don't eat dairy. I buy these. I put them on there. People go crazy. They don't usually see them on there. They're like, oh man, a dolma. It's really nice. It's for my, this is for my wife. No, no meat, no dairy. That's for her. Uh, nuts. Nuts are great. Uh, any kind of nuts. Uh, almonds, dry, dry almonds, uh, pistachios, cashews, uh, just, just more texture. You need, you know, you're just thinking about how many fun little things can you put in your mouth here at one time. Chefs, am I wrong, but just the conversation when you sit down in front of a charcuterie board and you get to try this with that or a little bit more of that jam or throw, yeah, try the fun. chocolate. Out. It, it's, a, it's a great conversational, but it's a, it's a great time as well. And we'll get into the pairing aspect with um, some spirits and some beer too and yeah, wine. Totally. Absolutely. I think you get a lot of interactive uh, discussion when it comes to boards with a whole bunch of really nice products on there. And just like Chef Brunson was saying earlier, there's almost endless combinations that you can have even with this, this decent amount of product that we have on the table today. 
Yeah. So it's funny. Like, so I actually like these lentil style salamis a little bit more. I like to cut them a little thicker. I don't like paper thin salami personally. Uh, that's a personal preference that I have. Um, I get it. A lot of a lot of restaurants like the like the large diameter so they can slice it thin. But to me, salami should have more of a a mouthfeel to it, like these. You know, we're cutting little just little rings. I just think you get so much more out of the product, so many so much more flavor that way. So here we got some River Bear Copa. We got some River Bear Orange Habanero. Our, and then River Bear Dry Chorizo. Those are going to be our three meats on our board today. Um, I always like a cracker of some sort. I like cracker more than I like bread. Um, I just like the texture of it. Like, I think bread's too chewy and soft. I want something crunchy. I'm re like, I'm a very textural person. So, I like, you know, something hard and crunchy. Um, some, we'll throw some olives on our board because we want some salty and fun. You know, we'll try to get some height mm -hmm. out of that. You know, put them in there. It's like teeing up a golf ball. It's like Caddyshack over here today. <laughs> so when we're talking about the whole meat copa, uh, what, yeah. or whole muscle, what muscle is uh, the copa made of? So it is made out of the top of the pork shoulder. Uh, the barbecue guys call that the money cut. It's a really cool piece of meat. It actually comes off like right here on the pig. Um, but it's this beautiful round piece of meat and it's got the star piece of fat through it, mm -hmm. like this fat star right here. Uh, this is my favorite piece of salumi. I think it's better than prosciutto. I would consider this the king of cured meats. Round and round, beef or pork, uh, copa is definitely the king, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, How about that lomo you got over there? Yeah. Uh, oh, yes, and we got some lomo. Um, does fat render in the curing process? It doesn't, but you'll see how my, my gloves have a little... I mean, this is when you know you have properly made salami. That glistens. Um, it's glistening. <laughs> it's called meiosis. There's meiosis going on right here. Like, if you're eating salami that doesn't do that, you're not eating good salami. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. So Take this is everybody. Lomo over here. This is uh, out of the pork loin. Mm -hmm. Comes off the loin. Pork chops. This is a dried pork chop. So we salt these for 30 days and dry them for, these two cuts take about um, four months to six months to make. Uh, these, these smaller cuts take about uh, uh, six weeks to eight weeks to dry in our room. Um, so back to building our board. Mm. We got four different pieces of meat. We got lomo, copa, orange habanero salami, and Spanish chorizo, all from River Bear Meats. Um, we're going to put some cheese on our board because who doesn't like cheese? You got to have the cheese. Yes. Um, I'm actually, I like to cut my cheese into smaller pieces. Uh, you just, I like it on a salumi board so you can pick up a little. Whatever mm -hmm. you pick up, you should be able to cram in your mouth. <laughs> you know? Can so you I, put like a reduced balsamic on there or? You could. No, 100%. Could could, it would be the same type of thing as this jam. Sure. We're going to use this lovely jam from our friend Vic over at Primo. He does a great job. Um, nuts. Who doesn't love nuts? That's like, right. You got to, <laughs> I mean, especially yours. <laughs> yeah, I think I got these ones from your mom for Christmas. Uh, they were part of my Christmas package from Patty. So these are Patty's nuts. Um, you know, and then just do some fun stuff too, like these dolmas. Maybe we'll cut them in half because a we'll whole dolma in your mouth is a little much. I mean, it's just kind of a fun thing. You know, you got your really fun vegan vegetarian friends over. Now they're not left. They can have some nuts. They can have some. Crackers, some dried fruit, you know, with their domas. Yeah, some olives. Yeah, some olives. We're, we're just making our, We're just trying to please everybody in our in our crowd yeah. here. Throw some Something apple on there, would yeah. you, Chef? Yeah, and then of course, you know, we have these beautiful, beautiful local apples. That's a honey crisp. I love honey crisps. I just I love the cr crunchiness of them. Try to keep my fingers on with these gloves. <laughs> Still got it. Um, you know, some fresh. Um, you know, I like the apple because it is fresh and it goes so well with the cheese. It's acidic and crunchy. So, you know, I think this is a, we're starting to shape into a, That's a pretty sexy little charcuterie board right here. That's I mean, good. Speaking of sexy I mean, charcuterie boards, where in town? Now, it, it, hands down, I would have gone to Old Major right away to get a great board, right? Yeah. Uh, moving on to bigger and better things, doing the meats. But, uh, guys, recommendations for anybody out there saying, hey, where do I go that just kills it with these boards? Um, I have a lot of places that I can I can I go. Yeah, go yeah. For it. So culture meat and cheese. Uh, we actually have our own meat and cheese board shop. Uh, there's t three locations. There's one in the airport, one in Denver Central Market, one in Lever's Local Vore. 
But I also think uh, Amos uh, Watts over at the Fist String, he has a beautiful board over there. Uh, I also think St. Killian's, the truffle. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marzix Fine Foods, they'll build a great board for you over at that spot as well. Um, where else? Oh, where There's a place else? in the Springs called Beasts and Brews, and um, oh, Chef Noah uh, Siebenhaller does a great job down there and loves to put together uh, charcuterie boards as well. Guys, do you have one in mind? I got a great one from a Truffle Cheese Shop on Six. Yeah, Truffle does a great job. Um, yeah, that's where I. That's probably where I go. Yeah. I like those guys because they're close to home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that's the thing, and that's the cool thing about like now. There's, I mean, there's so many small makers like myself making these cool cured meats in their mm-hmm. area. Mm-hmm. Like, there's not a big city you go to anymore that there isn't something like this being made in that city. Um, now I know that you, uh, you you're not a big drinker. No, you you don't like the beer, spirits, or wine. But but beer, wine, or spirits, all of the above. What you want to pair it with? I think you you just go with your palate, right? I mean, personally, I love acidic white wine with this. Really? Okay. I'm an acidic white wine drinker with this, but I will drink. I mean, also you can pair it with beer or bourbon or cocktails. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the great thing about. Um, a salumi board or charcuterie board or cured meat board, whatever the hell you want to call it. Mm-hmm. It's all the same thing, right? Um, is you can pair it with whatever you want to. I mean, there's no rules. I mean, rules are stupid. They're meant to be broke, right? Yeah. And that's what I like about eating like this. There aren't rules. Let's just have fun. And all the different little bite tastes and bite combinations right there. I mean, I'm thinking about eight different things to shove in my mouth at the same time. The sky's the limit. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. Chef Marcus, what's your preference of, of drink with this? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stick to a beer, but that's typically what I do anyway, like a yeah. Pilsner or something like that. Just something easy drinking uh, because you kind of want to, to take a, um, I guess, a second chair to whatever's going on to the charcuterie board itself. And you have so many different flavors that you want something kind of uh, on the side to enjoy everything on the board. I usually go for the wines. Go for the wines. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm a sucker for the wine. Yeah. <laughs> I would have I would have never thought white, but that's what I'm going to do. I'm a white wine drinker. I love white wine. French white wine is my thing. That's <laughs> fantastic. I mean, look at this board, you guys. I mean, that's that's exactly what you want to get when you go out to eat. Yeah, I mean, right there, that's dinner for two to four, three people right there. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a great dinner. Uh, chefs, take it away. Emily Griffith Culinary Quick Start. You can watch these things. This is a part of your curriculum. This is going to be kind of Thursday night's class. How exciting and fun is that? We're absolutely pumped for this one. I think uh, I'll come in here and make a little fresh sausage for us. Ooh, awesome. Yeah, I, got, I can't wait. got a wait. really cool new toy during quarantine, a little meat grinder. Oh, awesome, man. I can't wait to good be sausages. Uh, yeah. yeah, It'll be fun. It's going to be a good one. Yep. Cool. Sign up if you want to get in. It's a gimme again and uh, themoderneater.com. And check out Emily Griffith Culinary Quick Start. There's a tab that just says sign up here. And we'd love for you to join us for these classes. I've sat through each and every one of them, just interesting as can be. If you're sitting on the bench and you want to sharpen back up and get into that kitchen again, I'll tell you what, you, the, the owner-operators are lean and mean right now, and they want to bring back people that are active and the best of the best. Also, uh, if you're new to the industry or you want to get into it, to get into a kitchen, this is a great course that will give you that baseline of knowledge of what you need to get rolling as a line cook in the kitchen. I love what you guys do. We're going to switch roles here. Brunson's going to uh, do the next segment with these guys. And uh, take it away, Brunson. Just talk about, uh, ask him what's going to be going on in this next segment. Awesome, <laughs> fellas. What are we going to be doing in the next segment today? I think we're going to be busting out a little ceviche here. Uh, we've got some, we've got some shrimp here, some Miyagi oysters, and a nice snapper. Um, and we are just going to be macerating all of this in... Uh, citrus juice and kind of accenting it with some red onion uh, serrano and then we'll top it with some uh, avocado on top sounds pretty tasty that's going to come up in the next segment uh brunson's going to take the lead on that one and just thrilled always love having you in the kitchen hey have you guys heard of the um unknown tipper no (laughs) you haven't this guy's been going to come come over here jay real quick if you don't mind and take this microphone Jay Parker, ladies and gentlemen, you lined up a really great guest, Jay. Talk about, uh, first of all, how you got a hold of this guy and what he's doing right now. This is uh, really interesting. H- hello. 
uh, Modern Eater fans. So this guy, he calls himself the COVID Bandit, and for over for over a year now, it's not a it's not in a bad way. It's actually you know a good way. He's coming to. <laughs> yeah. He's coming with well, the COVID. I, I no. put in the description today when he strikes, it's it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And so for over a year now, he has been going out to local restaurants across the country, mind you, but a lot in Colorado. And uh, he's with this place that we have on today, the good folks up at uh, Notch Top Bakery and Cafe in Estes Park. He uh, had a twenty dollar tab and he tipped fourteen hundred. Oh, and, that's awesome! And he's been doing it for over <clears throat> a year, and it's like I was getting choked up. Sorry, those are fogging up my glasses. But um, that's what he does. And he does it. Uh, well, I'll let him tell you, oh, what cool but with dude. no notoriety. He doesn't want to be awesome. named. He doesn't Good want anybody him. to know he's doing this because it's important. And he knows how much restaurants people are the pillars like of our community. People yeah. like, we need more people like that in this world. It's so it's so amazing when people uh, just take that and take the drive and just go and do something. That would totally change somebody's world. I mean, that fourteen hundred dollar tip. I'm sure they split it between the staff sure. that night. It, it went to t- it went to, t- it worked out to two hundred bucks yeah. per employee, and that and that's something that he does. He figures out, you know, he. We don't want to give you too much. No, no, that's no, no. enough of a tease. Ooh, yeah. He's coming up a little bit later on the show. Next, it's with these gents. Brunson's going to lead it. Ceviche is next, right here, at the Modern Eater Show. As Jay's running, you there, Jay? Yes, sir. Okay, continues. Hey guys, Alex Armitas over at Sam's Number 3 Glendale. You want a Bloody Mary? You want a cheeseburger? You want a breakfast burrito? Greek salad? Bacon gyro meat? Chicken souvlaki? Barbecue ranch salad? We got you covered. Come down and see us. One more time. Try it again. Hey guys, Alex Armitas over here at Sam's Number 3 Glendale. Now get your ass to themoderneater.com. Thank you so much. We started Meridium Spirits because we love the way that spirits and cocktails can bring people together to socialize, to bond, to have conversations. Well, right now we've got some big conversations to have. Coop Vodka and Coop Gin are available at liquor stores across the metro area, but if you can't find us or would like to have us behind your bar or at your restaurant, send us an email, info at meridiumspirits.com. We know things are a little different these days, but think of us the next time you're planning a virtual happy hour or a socially distant picnic. And keep an eye on our social media, Coop by Meridium, for all the latest and greatest. Hey guys, it's Caroline Glover. I'm the chef owner of Annette out at Stanley Marketplace. Citrus is about to be in its prime. I just want to thank everybody for showing so much support to small local restaurants in this really hard time and you're watching the Modern Eater Show. (laughs) I'm fine with that. Back to the show in just a second, you guys, but you know what time it is. You know what time it is. I know what time it is. It's time for bread. Jack, it is time for bread. I know they're talking about meat, and we're doing charcuterie, and we got ceviche, so there's fish, and we cover in meat, but bread, baby, bread, aspenbaking.com. That's where you go to get the most fresh bread you've ever had in your entire life. It's delicious. Do you like chemicals? No, I don't. They don't put them in there. Do you like uh, 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 artificial coloring? Uh, I don't. They don't put that in there. They don't even freeze it like a lot of bakeries do. Do you know that bakeries freeze your bread and give it to you? Aspen Baking doesn't do that. Since 1994, Jeff, our buddy Jeff Nations over at Aspen Baking, he's been baking the freshest bread in the city. He is small business. He is local. He is bread. If you love gluten, butter, sugar, and eggs, man, this is the place for you. It's aspenbaking.com. It's got my seal of approval, which means the world to bread because that's all I need in life is bread. And now back to uh, Chef Justin Brunson, the guys from Culinary Quick Start and the Modern Eater Show. 
All right, here we are. We're back in the Modern Eater, Eater Kitchen, uh, sponsored by Elevation. Our friend Rich O'Brien with this great equipment that they bring in here so we can cook on all this stuff. This bomb slicer that I was using earlier. I mean, look how thin it made the meats. I mean, paper thin. You can see right through them. Thanks, Rich O'Brien at Elevation. <laughs> uh, awesome, boys. We're going to get back into this. Yeah. Uh, we, we made a charcuterie, salumi, dry cured board. And now we're going to make some ceviche. I love ceviche. Me too. I think this is one of my, my favorite applications for, for fresh things out of the ocean. Yeah. Something near and dear to my heart. I don't think I've ever met anything in the ocean that I wouldn't eat. <laughs> no, no. It's <laughs> funny. I'm known as a meat guy, but I love seafood more than I like meat, I think, at this point in my life. <laughs> All right. So I think we're just going to start with cleaning up some shrimp and some oysters here. These are Miyagi's. Awesome. Um, what we're going to do is just kind of cut down this back here with our kitchen scissors. And nice. then we're going to remove the entrails. Yeah. And the shell. And there's not always entrails in those guys, is there? No. Sometimes if you remove the head carefully, the entrails will come with the head. With them. Um, but they tend to get a little bit gritty if you leave them in. Um, and again, we're just going down the back here. I get you a little container of water. Yeah, thanks. Um, we're going to give these a quick rinse after we've peeled them. Yeah. So, yeah, again, we're just going down the back. What kind of shrimp are those? Those look beautiful. Those tigers? or uh, Those are gulp, white yeah, gulp. These white, are white gulp. White gulf shrimp, yeah. Absolutely beautiful. Very meaty, real sweet flavor to them. Yep. So you can see here we have a little bit of the intestinal tract, and we're just going to remove that. Um, Love getting that quality Seattle seafood. Oh, is, uh, this all came from Seattle? Oh, uh, yeah, from a purveyor that they sell to. <laughs> okay, oh, great. Yeah, no, Seattle does a great job. Okay, we're just <clears> going <throat> to give these a quick rinse Yeah, just a little rinse in there. Sure. Um, and these scissors are probably my favorite. Yeah, one of my the, favorite kitchen tools. The Joyce Chen's? Uh, these are the, the Silkies. The Silkies, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that 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 style of uh, a sh kitchen shear is really nice. They're really small. They don't get in the way at all. Yeah, get those hard to reach places. So, chef, when you're looking for uh, fresh uh, seafood like this, uh, what are you looking for? Um, I'm I'm kind of smelling first off. Yeah, I think um, shrimp is stink. That using your own nose is a good <laughs> yeah. one on, on the shellfish, right? Yeah. Looking at our fresh fish, you always want to smell them first, just like Chef Marcus had said. Um, another indicator that you can look at on a fresh fish would be look for their gills. You want to see yeah. really nice, vibrant red, not not kind of a gray or an off red, which usually means that the it's been sitting around for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, another indicator would be the eyeballs, which are always the first one that you probably yeah. look at, especially with a red snapper like this, yeah. with these great big eyeballs. You want to see... They want to look. They want to look like they, they just looked at you fresh yeah, from the like water. Like they don't have cataracts. Yeah, no cloud. No, they don't. <laughs> you don't want them sunken in there. Yeah, you don't want them sunken. Mm -hmm. And with red snapper in particular, you want to make sure that the eye is actually red. Correct. Because there's red. a false red snapper. Oh, there is. I didn't yeah. even know about this. There's a false red snapper that it does sure not is. have a red eye. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's all. I didn't know about that. That's great. Learned, the, that's the best thing about food. You're all constantly learning new stuff, right? That's right. I think you could spend 10 lifetimes and still have stuff oh, to learn. I mean, I've been doing this for 23 years, and I still feel like I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. So with the sh shellfish, a great thing to do to make sure it's fresh. We get a good sniff on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's totally okay to ask your fishmonger to take a sniff of your fish before you buy it. Right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right? I don't think if you were at a place where the fishmonger – <laughs> wouldn't let you. Well, I mean, maybe this is pre-COVID. I mean, with COVID going on, I don't know. I'm not sure. But, I mean, pre-COVID, 100%, you want to make sure that you, you give anything a good smell. Definitely. Even with our masks on, you can probably smell a fish or a seafood that, product starting to turn south. That's true. Pretty quick. And, and then, um, what kind of oysters do you have here, Chef? Uh, we have Miyagi. Miyagi. Miyagi's. Is that, and that's a, is that a West Coast oyster? I think it is, right? Sure is. Um, I think Miyagi's a West Coast. they got deep cups. Uh, and it's going to be more of that that melony, uh, kind of fruity yeah, flavor, fruity melony, fatty flavor, which will be great with ceviche. Absolutely. Yeah. Do we have any of that cucumber? I think cucumber would be nice in here. I think so. Ooh, Let me go check. Yeah, cucumber, which is a melon. <laughs> yep. Um, awesome. Um, and then you know, like when we're uh, looking for uh, oh, we 
Chinese stores, I do the same thing. I always like to yep. make sure that they're all tight and closed up like these ones are. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. you want to make sure and that... they're clean, right? Yeah, I give these a scrub, give it a quick scrub or at least a rinse and then... Um, I just kind of make sure that there's no debris around the uh, yeah dirt. A lot of time there. that yeah. around this hinge you'll get mud. Exactly. right? Exactly. So we want to make sure that those are as clean as possible. And also, just um, all of these bivalves should come with a tag um, that yeah. says where they are harvested and the date they are harvested. So mm -hmm. you want to make sure that uh, you're getting as fresh of seafood as possible. So always make sure that you're kind of checking those tags. Yeah. Ooh, Chef Marcus, would you explain to us what a bivalve is? Uh, <laughs> Uh, bivalve is just going to be anything that's like a, an oyster, clam, mussel. Uh, it's a type of crustacean, right? Yeah, they're all crustaceans. There's only an entering, an, it enters and exits, right? Yep. Bivalve and two valves. We love one these. in, one out. <laughs> we love these guys because they, they, they basically, they're janitors of the sea, man. Yeah. The custodians. Clean, the custodians. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love shellfish. I love oysters. They're actually one of my favorite foods in the whole world. Me yeah. too. Um, they do still freak me out to uh, open them a little bit, personally. One time, me and my, <laughs> um, my best pal went up to Jack's Seafood up there in Boulder and tried to see how many oysters we could eat. I oh. put down about 52 of them wow. before they had Pretty to carry impressive. us both out of there. I was actually part of the Great West Oyster Eating, <laughs> eating Contest here in Denver, and I ate 74 in 30 oh. seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds? Yeah, it was disgusting. Just like out of a bag or something? Uh, no, out of a shell. They, <laughs> they do it every year. Jack's puts it on with Seattle Seafood or say Seattle or Northeast Seafood, and they do a huge it's, – it's hilarious. There's teams of four people. Uh, they do it every year, uh, not this year because of COVID, of course, but uh, it's a lot, of, a lot of fun. I think my team ate like uh, 240 oysters oh in their two minutes. I might have been able to catch you if I wasn't drinking beer that yeah. day. Yeah, <laughs> I saw a guy that just poured them all into a pint glass and drank them. I think that's how I, that's how I do it. It was one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. Oh, my goodness. Awesome. This is great. We got some beautiful oysters getting shucked over here. We got some beautiful... Fresh cucumber over here, getting chopped up. Yep, so what we're doing is, you can see there's a hinge right here, and we're gonna take this uh, shucker, this is a Boston shucker. Um, using a towel, we're gonna stabilize it, and we're just gonna put the tip into the hinge there, and we're gonna use a twisting motion to kind of pop the top of it off. Um, you'll notice that there's a cup side and there's a flatter side. We wanna have the cup side on the bottom so it can we can keep all that liquor. So, Chef Marcus, what is the liquor? Liquor's all that tasty juice um, that accompanies uh, oysters. And it's also a really good way to kind of gauge how fresh they fresh are. Fresh they are, right? Yeah, you want a, a real juicy oyster, right? Exactly. Uh, I absolutely love oysters. I really do. They're one of my favorite things in the whole world, but they're always so expensive at restaurants. And if you think about why, well, hey, they got to go grow these things. They grow them for two years, all right? And then they ship them here, they put them in a box, and they FedEx them to Denver, <laughs> right? And then when they get here, they got to get sorted, and then they get hand scrubbed. I noticed that you yep. scrubbed your oysters. Uh, if not, they're covered in mud and all kinds of other stuff from the ocean. I've seen, I've found little crabs in them before. I mean, oh, yeah. it's crazy when you pop an oyster, what's going to be in there? Is it going to be a pearl, a little crab? And then you uh, think about the yield that you get on an oyster, too. Like yeah. <laughs> the, the, most of the weight you're throwing out. Yeah, 99% of it gets thrown away. And then, I mean, there are dead ones, right? So yep. I would, you know, even if you're getting the freshest oysters, there's probably one in every dozen or, you know, one in every dozen yeah. that doesn't make the trip from the bottom of the ocean to the, mm -hmm. to the, bo to the, the fish harbor, to FedEx, to the airplane, to Denver. I mean, it's just think it's it's a hard it's it's a rough life. The monger I went to this morning for these beauties, uh, he's a really cool guy, man. He was he was like, you know what? Just in case you get a couple of dry ones, I'll just I'll throw a couple extras in there for yeah. you. No worries. That's yeah, that's awesome. This is kind Quality of those, service. Oh yeah, yeah. these dry guys. Yeah, um, yeah. You don't want you want like that. a nice plump one. Yeah, you, you see these. that? Don't eat it. Yeah, you'll poop your pants. Yeah, Brustin, can we cure that? <laughs> no, that already looks cured. That already looks cured. Um, <laughs> So I'm a big fan. I was so I had, I used to have this restaurant called Old Major, and we always had fresh oysters on the menu because I think there's no finer way to start a, a meal than a dozen oysters and a glass of French Chablis. Ooh. Like it, come on, like that is awesome. So 
we used to shuck a ton of oysters, and I would give them all the sniff. I would be back there popping rocks, and I'd be sniff. I'd sniff every one of them. <laughs> I did because sometimes they'll look good, but if you don't give them that sniff test, it's yeah, it's really oof. obvious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean it's it's bad. I mean sometimes you open them up and they're just full of mud. There's oof. nothing but mud inside of them. <laughs> uh, but when they are perfect, they I mean. That when they are perfect, you pop them into your mouth and you get this beautiful snap and pop, and it just your mouth fills with this luscious, fatty saltiness. It's absolutely amazing. I really do like Chablis with the. Uh, yeah. With the Chablis and oysters all day. I'm not really that into the French, but man, they make some great <laughs> wine. All right. So, we've got. Yeah, right. So we got some, we're going cucumbers, we're going avocados. Yeah. Um, we got shrimps. Shrimpins. Uh, the shrimpins we're just going to kind of trim up into little segments like this. Nice. Kind of following the natural, you can see natural lines that run along the uh, body yeah. of the shrimp here. And we're just going to. They're almost like all abs. Like a shrimp is all ab muscles, which I know nothing about. But <laughs> Are the shrimp the gym rats of the sea? <laughs> yes, <laughs> most definitely. Uh, the quality of the seafood, guys, looks absolutely amazing. Yeah, give a shout out to that Seattle seafood. Yeah, Seattle Fish Company. You guys do it right. That's my boy Pat Zobi over there, keeping it real. Awesome. So we're gonna. So uh, this is like a very traditional style. Like, uh, would you say uh, Mexican South American style ceviche? Yeah. Um, Central American. Maybe like a. This is probably like a TJ style. A little Tijuana TJ, style. Maybe. I've never been to Tijuana. Gotta represent. <laughs> Uh, well, no. Ensenada style, you know? Ensenada style with the tomatoes. You got serranos, <laughs> the avocado. All right, let's do some uh, red onion up in there. Yeah. Awesome. I love red onion. Yeah, that's a little bite. How much avocado you want the whole thing? Yeah. Perhaps. Man, we had these great red onions this summer from Petraco Farms. Mm-hmm. I got a. I was lucky enough to get a tour up there. Nice. I had driven by this place. I mean, I've been driven by it a dozen times and never seen it. I mean, I've seen it, and I was like, where does all that produce go? <laughs> and then Greg and the guys took me up there, and we did a show from up there this summer, and it was just awesome to watch that local produce and their whole program. And It just was really, really neat. Super cool. And where's the farm? Uh, it's uh, just, what town? Hey, Greg, what town is that in? It's on its way, yeah, right up on its way to Brighton. Yeah, guys, I always, we always encourage our students to eat local. Yeah. Um, and, and understand where your food is coming, coming from. Coming from. I it's didn't. really important. I didn't know. It's funny. I drove by there. I was like, where does that produce go? Where is that from? I had no idea because there's no sign on the highway. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, it's right on 85. Uh, it's eight, right, 85 on the way up through Brighton there. Uh, just so cool to learn what they do there, though. Jay blacked out the experience, though. Jay here. <laughs> Seriously. What, what's... Let, let me ask you a question. The, the trip you're talking about with Petraco, I've seen pictures to it. Was I there for that trip? No, Can... you were not. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, you were not. Jay was not there. Greg, I, 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 re- Ryan Freeman. I refer 30 seconds back to Greg uh, Hollenbeck. When we, <laughs> yeah, when we were running around in the field and they were plucking the corn out and we were running <laughs> along with that combine, what... Was he there with us filming? Come on, Brunson. Oh, shit. Maybe he was. I think he was. <laughs> we, no, I you mean, know what? I don't I'm think t- he was. I'm telling you. And, and I know me, I... you, and Brian on the way up there, and you guys were fighting like a married couple on the way there. <laughs> I just wanted to jump out of the truck. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I felt like I was with my parents again. No wonder they got divorced. Jesus. <laughs> All right, so back, back to this beautiful ceviche over here. So we got a red snapper. Yep, just going to take this head off. Awesome. I love fish. I love the actual animal and the band very much. Um, so uh, red snapper uh, comes from the Gulf. Uh, it's one of it's one of my favorite fish. Uh, 
So most of the American snapper that is harvested and eaten in the United States comes from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, actually, it comes from Galveston, Texas, the hottest, most humid place in America. Uh, not a great place to hang out, but a great place to go snapper fishing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, these beautiful snapper love the, the Gulf there. Uh, it's crazy. They, they actually school up around these big uh, oil rigs down there. And you just, you just go and you can you can catch them. I actually got to go on a trip with some local chefs. Uh, uh, my real good friend Brandon Foster and uh, Lori Mitson was there. Paul C. Riley was there. Uh, the folks from Seattle Fish took us down there. Uh, it, w- it was a really fun experience to actually go to the golf and catch these guys. That's fantastic. Yeah. How uh, they fight? They fight good. I mean, I don't know. I'm a fly fisherman, so mm-hmm. you take me deep sea fishing. It's a, <laughs> It's a little different. A little different world, yeah. It's yeah. more hanging off the boat, boat throwing up than uh, <laughs> fishing. <laughs> Should ask him if you could go up on the dairy. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but, yeah, this is my, one of my favorite fish. It's very mild. It's flaky. It's white. It makes some of the sexiest ceviche, I think. Good choice, boys. Thank you. We, we appreciate the snapper. Yeah. Let's see where one <laughs> fillet gets us first. Wow, look at this. So when we make ceviche, uh, it's actually being cooked by that acid from this lime? Correct. A little bit of acid, a little bit of thyme. So if you find yourself uh, very hungry and your gas goes out or your power goes out, you can, if you get the appropriate yeah. ingredients, you can still cook dinner. Yeah, no, 100%. Uh, I mean, this with a nice margarita and some saltine crackers Ooh. and some hot sauce. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm a patio, baby. I, I am a happy man. <laughs> on, on that note, though, but so curing meat and then this process as well, there's some similarities there. Very similar, actually. So, I mean, the, the, the salumi that we just sliced is actually all raw as well. It is just salt cured or cooked by the salt. So this is being cooked by acid and by salt and the the cured meat has that more of a uh a meaty texture a cooked texture from just the salt pretty cool i mean I how come salt. you couldn't do that in reverse how come you couldn't cure the meat with the acid and how come you couldn't do the ceviche with salt uh you you'd have pickled meat <laughs> yeah you would have pickled meat which uh we all know as corned beef <laughs> so corned beef is pickled um, I mean, they're both pickles. I mean, that one, this one's using acid. That one's using salt. Yeah. Uh, they both use liquid. Uh, Science, that one's baby. mostly the liquid that comes out of the meat. Where this one is the lime juice as well. Um, and these things were all discovered kind of necessity without fire. Like no, hundred percent. Like how do we how do we extend the shelf life of this product? We have limes. We have fish. You know, uh, so potted some- meat is something you hear about a lot, right? In the in the history of meat, well, potted meat has its corned beef and pastrami. Um, both delicious. Yes, both delicious. <laughs> uh, it's so crazy. So I grew up in Iowa, and I didn't have any kind of raw fish or even somewhat cooked fish. Like a lot of times, I feel like the outside of this would be cooked, the inside would be raw. At least it's, that's where it is when I like it. Uh-huh. Um, but I never had any kind of sushi or raw fish or anything until I was 21 years old. Man. I mean, I, I grew up on a farm and I was out in the country. My mom told me if I ate raw fish, I was going to die. <laughs> <laughs> Mine I, did too, but it I, didn't stop me. And, and I listened to her. It wasn't until I was 21, I was in L.A. seeing a friend. It was the first time I had sushi, which, I mean, it just blows my mind to think that I'm the chef that never even ate raw fish until I was 21 years old. <laughs> 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 Welcome home, yes, brother. Yes, six years later, I opened my first restaurant as an owner. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> the, uh, Colorado, Denver here especially, we're pretty fortunate to get a really nice array of food. Yeah. Some real diversity. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're right off Federal Boulevard over here. Like, some of the best, I mean, my favorite fuss spot. I mean, mm-hmm. there's there's so much good ethnic food in the city. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chef Marcus <laughs> turned me on to the best torta place I've I've never been to about Tarascos? two weeks. Oh, Las Tortugas, man. Las Tartugas. Yeah. Oh, Ooh, the, baby. What's their taco spot right next door in the little pink building? Uh, oh, <laughs> it looks like a house, right? So yeah. amazing. Oh, yep. God. I can't, I can't tell you the name of it, but I can drive you there right now. Good stuff, man. Cash only. It's still fire tacos. I think we try to encourage our students to eat at places that would... 
Yeah. Probably not be the first choice that they would walk in the front door. I yeah. mean, you, you oftentimes will get pleasantly surprised. There's a lot of hidden gems, so especially many. around Pharaoh. Yeah. yeah, Star Kitchen, Fun 95. I mean, Tarascos is great over here. This goes on. Uh, yeah, just on and on and on. So, cilantro. I love cilantro. Oh, yeah, my favorite. People are so funny. They say it tastes like soap. That's a genetic thing. Yeah. yeah. Is it a genetic thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're just... They, I just figured they were animals. <laughs> Uh, it is really a genetic thing, huh? Mm-hmm. I love cilantro. I mean, I put cilantro in there. Cilantro, mint, basil, that oh, yeah. combo. Oh, yeah, that, wow. Like, that is a fun combo. Southeast Asian kind of trinity. So, again, this is uh, during the um, class in the evenings at yeah. Emily Griffith Culinary Quick Start. These are some of the things that you cover, isn't it, Jens? Absolutely. We're going to go over fish butchery on uh, Wednesday, I believe is our fish day. And we're going to do... Uh, Probably a few different recipes. We're going to teach them how to break down fish, uh, the the difference between flat fish, round fish, uh, that and sustainability, um, oh, uh, responsible fishing. Because you want to, you know, I mean, we've always got the the, the big ones, like the big five, right? Uh, and I don't know, the sea has so many more fish to offer us outside of just you know salmon, cod. God, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so much. Is more. that what you meant by the big five? Yeah, oh, it's there's funny. a few more out there. I mean, we. we I have a butcher shop, and we sell so much salmon. Yeah, halibut. It, it is absolutely out of control. Like, everybody just wants salmon, 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 salmon. I'm I like, know. there's all these other delicious fish. I think they think it's, they might feel it's safe, just not enough exposure. Well, they know how to cook it, right? right I think right. that's a big thing. It's hard to overcook it. Uh, it's hard to overcook it. It, uh, it You know, it's... It's nice and fatty. Mm-hmm. It's uh, I guess it's forgiving in that way. Yeah, yeah. you can res- cook it so many different ways yeah. as well. Receptive really, the application and then its sauces. I guess you could say too. And then yeah. cure it, cure it that as well. Yeah, it's yeah, good. Yeah. delicious. Cure it, smoke it. Yeah, I, I like. I mean, raw. We'll probably cure some salmon too. Uh, just, just for de- demonstration, because it's going to take a few days for that thing to get ready. Yeah. But either way, we can show them how to do it. Then we'd have that for next month. Yeah. What do you think? Roll it over. Let's do it. Cool. Chef Brunson, you. I mean, these guys are awesome. Well, and you're awesome too, man. I mean, I'm listen. A big fan of Emily, yeah. Emily Griffith. I've been down there. I've helped teach classes down there. I think what they do for our community is an amazing thing. You know, uh, I'm I'm super into food education, teaching people about food and cooking. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really what I know about and what I can teach about. That's three week it. course. It's a gimme. It's a three week course. It's a three, three week weeks. course. Three. Come on. We're trying to save the city, man. Yeah. yeah. As soon as these restaurants rebound, they're going to need some very. Uh, what a great opportunity for somebody to come in and learn some uh, basic culinary skills. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, be taught by passionate, educated totally. people like these two fellows. And oh, have sure. guest chefs like uh, you come in. It's yeah. f- it's free ninety nine. It's free. How that's could you, how could you say free, no? Free. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good, the the price is right. Plus, just, you get the serve safe certification and uh, just that baseline of knowledge to get you going in a kitchen or to knock that rust off. And there's a lot of stuff that you're learning and just great guests all together. So jump in on that. TheModernEater.com, Emily Gr- Griffith Culinary Quick Start tab. Just click on that. There's all the information you need. Great job. Set up our next segment. We talking to the uh, bandit that's going around Ooh. tipping. The tip bandit. COVID bandit. Oh, the COVID bandit. <laughs> Everybody, call, I can't wait to watch Next Modern Eater. Is it today? Yep, today. The COVID today. bandit's going to be next. Oh, next. Here we go. Next uh, live on the Modern Eater, the Colorado tip bandit. Dropping those big bills for all of our service industry people during our COVID times. I love it, man. Thank you. Justin Brunson, River Bear American Meats. Again, our chefs in-house. We love you guys so much. You're just doing such great things for this we community. Love you guys. Thank chef, you so much. Chef Blake and uh, Chef Marcus will be back with the Tip Bandit next. The Modern Eater Show continues. Hi, I'm Amber with Strohauer Farms. And I'm just here to remind you that the best potatoes are grown here in Colorado. Goodness elevated. Thanks for watching the Modern Eater Show. <laughs> hey, Zach Ryder here, Colorado Mills Sunflower Products out of Lamar, Colorado. Your only local source grown from a local crop to produce a local oil for local chefs. You can find it at Shamrock Foods, What Chefs Want, Seattle Fish Company. Uh, let me try it one more time, then we'll see. Hey, restaurants, we're glad you're reopening from Colorado Mills Sunflower Oil. We'll see you soon. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
First, we partner with the best farmers in the world, and then we tell them, we will take it all. Process whole spices daily, blend custom spices to order, keep it fresh, safe, and flavorful, all so that you can get back to doing what you do best. So whether you're a restaurant, a food manufacturer, or an at-home cook, be sure to visit The Spice Guy at www.thespiceguyco.com. Hey Modern Eater fans, I'm Don Trobo with The Annex by Art at Mills, and I just wanted to give you a heads up about some of the great things we've got going on locally in the state. We're headquartered right here, and we're working with farmers in the San Luis Valley to bring you amazing Colorado quinoa. It's just like the South American stuff, but grown locally. We've got transitional wheat flour that's grown by farmers in Colorado and surrounding states who are in the process of, of turning their fields into organic. So we're taking that transitional wheat and turning it into flour, and now it's available for you to cook and bake with. And last but not least, we're now cleaning grain berries in Denver. So things like spelt or wheat berries uh, or pearl barley, those are things that we're now doing right here locally and are available to you. Can't wait to share it with you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff Nations from Aspen Baking Company. It's really important right now to support local. That's why I support the Modern Eater. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to a Monday. It is January 25th, and uh, we've got the COVID bandit coming up. Got to thank Justin Brunson and all the team from Emily Griffith Culinary Quick Start. Again, themoderneater.com. There's a sign up for you right there if you want to join them. It's a great class. It really is. Uh, COVID bandit on the way, Jay, which this is really interesting. So a gentleman is going around tough times, and tips are so appreciated in this industry that's just been devastated right a little extra cash never hurts oh it makes a huge You're difference. A good tipper i'm a i'm a great tipper i'm not uh, bandit uh, uh worthy of tipping but i i'm about a 50 percenter yeah we're gonna head to estes park colorado and fourteen hundred dollar tip that he laid on these great folks at the uh, notch top bakery in estes park let's do that are these guys ready to go they should be Okay. I'm hoping. I love it. There they are. We've got, we've got the gentleman himself. He's the COVID bandit. And we also have, um, d d tell us who you are. I'm Nalia Kramietvaliva. I'm the owner of the Notch Top. Here's the. I am Gloria Fuentes. I'm a server in Notch Top. I'm Jamie Johnson, and I'm a server at Notch Top. Oh, man. This is going to be a great conversation. Let's dig in. Is this the COVID <laughs> bandit right here? Yes. <laughs> yes. Hi. Hi. How are you? Uh, $1,400 tip. I think everybody ended up getting about 200 bucks, right? Whoever was on, uh, on the clock yeah. that night. We're talking about who named you the COVID bandit? I'm not sure which restaurant started calling me that. Uh, it's just as I've been doing this, I guess they, they said because they never know when or where I'm going to show up, where I'm going to strike. Where you're going to strike next. Can't wait to dig in and hear the story. But the name COVID Bandit, there's all kinds of stuff that goes inside the, my head anyway. Is it good? Is it bad? Who, who, you know, obviously, you're a great guy. But Jay and I came up with a couple of names ourselves. We're not trying to rename you or anything. And you guys have probably thought of this too. But Jay, he, he might be the rainmaker. Right, going <laughs> the rain, the rainmaker, making it rain. That could, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I can be, see that one. What What do you have? Uh, how about a uh, King Tip? Ooh, King Tip. That's a, that's a pretty good one. How about in the uh, spirit of a sugar daddy, the server daddy? Oh, yeah. that's pretty good. Could that be pretty good? Okay, one? he's well, throwing gratuity bombs. Uh, well, hold on now. Are you gonna you gonna do yeah, multiple? Go ahead, how about uh, the God of gratuity? Ooh. <laughs> That's, mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. you don't like that one? No. Okay, uh, here's another one for you. The day maker, making people's days. Yeah, I like yeah. that one. Ooh, you oh, like the day suck. maker? <laughs> uh, uh, well, how, how, about, about, okay. how about the server savior? Server savior, that's pretty good. Uh, how about St. Francis of Gratuity? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how, about, how about the restaurant rehabilitator? Uh, that's a good one, too. Yeah. But the uh, COVID ban, it, it's so good to see and have you here. Let's tell the story because uh, so much time that we've covered throughout COVID and just seeing restaurants 
get demolished and servers getting batted back and forth like a, a ping pong game, furloughed, back to work, furloughed, back to work, trying to get unemployment. You know the deal. What inspired you to do this? Well, I think that probably starting out, I've had every one of their jobs. That's why I go over and beyond just the waiter or waitress. I, I know the dishwasher in the back or the bus person or the cooks. Uh, I've had all those jobs and <clears throat> those people don't see tips. So I just started doing it. And uh, one restaurant owner came to me and said, well, do you know you're the first person to ever do that? And I didn't realize it. And I said, well, no. But anyway, so sometimes I do it. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I tip normal. Uh, you never know. There's no... No rhyme or reason. Or, right. When you're feeling it. Right. I like that when you're feeling it. So you prefer to always stay anonymous. This isn't a thing to where you're trying to promote yourself or a brand or anything yeah. else. It's just when you're feeling it. Now, here's the thing. When, when you leave gratuity, these guys like cash. Are you leaving cash or are you doing it on a card? Right. Other restaurants have, um, if I do use a card, sometimes they'll ask me, oh, can we promote this or put it on our Facebook or whatever. And I've said no for about a year. And Knox Top was the first one that just did it <laughs> <laughs> without asking. And so they busted my cover. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. And, but, here, and here uh, you are. I think the, your cover needs to be busted. I mean, truly. And ladies, I'm going to send it over to you. Any, anybody can answer. But just set up what that day was like. Just another day in COVID. What, what, what month was it? What day was it? Do you kind of remember the mood of the day? And then tell us the story. Um, it was Wednesday, I think it was the 20th. Mm -hmm. And we came to work in the morning, like a normal day. And I was talking with Jamie that day and we were like, these are hard times, but we have to be positive. And then she was telling me, telling me I have to make it to um, pay my rent. And I was telling her, me too. Let's be positive. I, maybe it's Wednesday. It's going to be a very slow day. But, you know, God is going to give us a blessing and just be positive yeah. all the time. We have to be, no matter what's going to happen. And then we were having that conversation that morning. And it started like in a slow day. And then later we started having some tables. <laughs> and then he came and, um, I wait on him before, like, mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly how long ago before they closed us. Before the close, before the, they, they closed us for the second lockdown for the to-go orders again, yeah. Yeah, I waited on him before, but I, I didn't, my memory is so bad, I didn't recognize him. <laughs> so I'm sorry for that. <laughs> and then oh, the I, bandit, you're not supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he was nice, I was nice with him, and then um, he told me, Gloria, you remember about me? And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I, I didn't. And then he told me, um, before he called me at um, two, before the closing, and then I asked him, how do you know all these bad things are going to happen? Like, like um, do you remember that? <laughs> no. I told you, how do you know um, they're going to close us again? Yeah, because right before the lockdown, he left her a nice tip, uh, $150. And right after that, they lock us down. And uh, that's why the, um, it's a, it, we, when, when, uh, when the COVID bandit left, I felt so bad. I, I wanted to thank him for everything he does for us. And it's, you know, it's a, such a pleasure, such a kind man. And, uh, you know, we wanted to thank, I'm so sorry, we didn't mean to take uh, your privacy or anything. We just wanted truly to thank you for everything you do. It's very kind of you, very nice of you. You really touch not only us, 
it's a families it's a full families of each employee mm -hmm. you know that day they were all very happy crying you know so uh we just wanted to thank him and uh we put the story mm -hmm. on our our vision of it just that we wanted to thank and on a facebook mm -hmm. and you, you yeah know, so when, when he left the tip and i saw i didn't saw the book for our launch i was having the book uh, on she the didn't side. look at the book i didn't look at the book and then when i saw the book i was like come on <laughs> what kind of issue am i breathing like it was like a big big surprise and then i was like probably i'm crazy or probably I'm looking at the numbers and I show it to her. She showed it to Jamie. <laughs> I, 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 I was astounded, like where you were saying, you know, we come in and Nelly really promotes all of us being a family here in this restaurant. And that's one of the things that we really enjoy and care about working here is because we're all a family and we all realize that we're having tough times and that we rely on each other to hold each other up. And so me and Gloria were talking about it. We each have a goal that we have to make for the day to be able to pay our bills and stuff. And there are a lot of days where we're not sure if we're even going to make those goals. And, you know, there are a lot of times where we don't. And so we looked at each other in the morning and I said, this is how much I need to make to get through today and make it. And she looked at me and told me how much she needed to make. And so it was funny because we just looked at each other and we're like, okay, we're going to do this today. And when she opened up the book and she showed me, it was like, oh my God. You know, she looked at me and she was like, we made it. <laughs> great. Now, I mean, $200 a piece, I mean, that's nothing to shake a stick at. That's a good amount of money. It's, it's not going to change your life forever, but I think it probably changed your attitude a little bit. It probably gave you an outlook of generosity for others as well. And, uh, boy, we just wish you would have won that $1 billion lottery that happened. <laughs> I think you'd be cracking off a lot. How, how much money, uh, COVID Bandit here with us, how much money have you all to get, if you don't mind me asking? have done and thrown into the community of people that needed it so much. No comment. I figured as much. I figured as much. Well, you're going to keep it going, I would imagine. And um, it's interesting. With COVID, you, people wear masks, and you get to see their eyes now. You're not looking all over their face. And I'm looking into your eyes and everybody else. This really made a difference in the world. And for that, I commend you. Um, uh, I think that the, this left an impression on these gals that, you know, who knows? They may be the bandit some days themselves because of you. Um, for that, that's amazing. Okay, guys, let's let's ask the bandit. Tell us about that restaurant. What do you like to eat there? Fantastic place for breakfast or lunch. Uh, uh, I've always came for breakfast. Uh, there's nothing bad on the menu. It's one of those restaurants where you, uh, your hardest decision is, is what you want. It's not a question of if it's good or not. And uh, I, the only reason I got here is by word of mouth. I mean, they're known all over the place. And uh, it takes quite a while for me to drive here. And uh, so I made the drive and I was not disappointed. That's why I came back a second time. That's great. Um, I'd like to do a shout out <clears throat> to anybody else that happens to wear a mask. Uh huh. Oh, what happened, Jay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not that hard. Wait, hold on, <laughs> hold on. Right, the the internet gods did their deal just a second ago, or they're doing it right now too. Um, the connection on the Zoom call. Just when you said, if you can still hear my voice, what do we got, Jay? Just. Um. Oh, man, isn't that our, just our luck? Yeah, I'm just I'm losing them. You're losing them? Uh-huh. I wanted to do a shout-out. Uh, <laughs> That's just so good. Well, we can. I put the camera on me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know, guys, but I think we lost them. Maybe Jay Park will try and, and get them back here shortly. We are going to end the show. One thing I can tell you is, as we speak, Biker Jim Pittenger is on the – is this camera hot? Mm -hmm. Okay. Biker yeah. Jim Pittenger is on his way over to the kitchen. We're going to go over to Proud Souls Barbecue and Provisions, and we're going to pick up a nice bill, uh, grill for Biker Jim. So I'd keep a, an, an eye on our Instagram story. Okay, back to it. Sorry, guys, we lost our connection with you for a minute. I am so glad that you're back. Um, COVID Bandit, you were in the middle of saying, I want to put out a shout-out to, and then it just cut out. Can you try that one again? Oh. 
Well, I want to put a shout out to everybody that's wearing a COVID mask because you too can be a COVID bandit. It's very easy. Just and think beyond just the waiter or waitresses, the dishwashers, the cooks, the people that bust the tables. It it takes a chain to make you happy. So do what you can. And you're already dressed for the occasion. So mm-hmm. get out there and just do it. They're the pillars of our community. They're the spirits of our soul. There are restaurants, there are bars, there are grills. They're where we have anniversaries and weddings and and first dates. And they're, they mean the world to us. And, and really, your actions have been fantastic. We need to get up there and see you guys at Notch Top Bakery. And if we get up there and get a little tour, what would you recommend to get off of the menu there, Nelia? Um, I would recommend to try a little bit of everything. And if you come, I'll make you pretty any. <laughs> She's going to say she'd make us anything, she's, Jay. I think she said pretty eggs is what I heard. but um, Pretty eggs? That's, I, mean, I that's thought what I, I heard, heard pretty much everything oh. on the menu. Well, I mean, that probably make more sense than pretty eggs. I think this is a good way to exit it. Um, these guys, Notch Top Bakery. I'm going to just switch the words around for a second. Top Notch Bakery. You know, I, I seem I, like top notch. And people, I thought so it was gotta... a play on words. Um, What's a Notch Top? Uh, it, it's uh, the name of a mountain range out there. Oh, is it really? Yeah, in Estes Park. Um, and well, so it might have been a play on words for the mountain that, range. Th- and that was my next thought. It's like, well, somewhere it's a play on words. All right, Biker Jim's going to come over. We're going to go buy a grill from Proud Soul, Souls Barbecue and Provisions. Uh, Jay Parker, great work as always. Got to thank the guys from Emily Griffith Culinary Quick Start. And I'm telling you, make an education cool again. Sign up now. Next month's classes. It's a three-week course. It's a gimme. It's just for you. Uh, We had a poll today on the um, stream. What is your favorite accoutrement on your charcuterie board, Jay? Is it cheese? Is it fruit? Is it nuts? Or is it chocolate? What's your favorite? Uh, Mine would be either the, the fruit if it's dried. I mean, I like fresh fruit, but... Well, one of my favorite things about... Uh, so we've got an 84%, a 0 a 5%, and an 11%. Cheese coming in at 84%, which it should. Uh, nuts at 5%. Chocolate at 11%. And guess what had zero votes, Jay? Uh, Fruit. Fruit. <laughs> Nobody well, then, wants the well, then it's fitting that that's my favorite board. part of the charcuterie. Thank you, Justin Brunson, for coming in today and uh, schooling us on charcuterie. River Bear American Meats, another great local brand. Also, I call him the day maker. He's the COVID bandit joining us on the show today. That's a just a happy story, Jay. Yeah, it was... Um I, I talked to the gentleman on the phone for a long time. Real interesting dude. You know, nice I, I can't share any of it, but he's real interesting. Nice guy. They've outed his name. It doesn't matter. It's not about his name or anything else. It's about the spirit. And boy, does that spirit carry through. Um, that's the truth. So for Jay Parker and myself, Greg Hollenbach, uh, we're going to kick that rock down the road Wednesday. We'll be right back here at Studio Kitchen. What do we have planned for Wednesday, Jay? Um, um, I don't know. Anything? I don't think so. Wednesday? Okay. We got an intern coming in. Yeah. All right. We'll uh, see you Wednesday with uh, I Don't Know. We got some work to do. The Modern Eater Show continues. Hey, you guys. Jay here with The Modern Eater Show. Thanks for watching. Don't forget about our YouTube and Instagram channels. A lot of killer content over there. Throw us a subscribe on YouTube. Throw us a follow on Instagram. And thank you for supporting TME. We couldn't do this without our amazing sponsors, so let's check them out right now. Very proud to be part of the the Modern Eater and uh, chefs, restaurant owners, any food service operators. You know, I know right now that uh, delivery and carry out is bigger than ever. 
And we got you covered. Uh, Cambro uh, has a full line of uh, delivery and carry out items. More economical options are expanded polypropylene or EPP, a uh, nice insulated container. Uh, the ProCard Ultra is really versatile. It's a great unit because you can actually store cold products down here, hot products up here. It's all 120. There's no refrigeration worries. It's all thermodynamics. Just let us know what your food service challenges are, what it is we can do to help you out. And there isn't anything that we can't do for you. So uh, hope to see you over here at our facility in Park Hill soon and uh, stay safe out there. You know everybody, with several million dollars of hard assets here, insurance is very, very important to us. Ewing Levitt covers it all. Machinery, building, workman's comp. Ewing Levitt's got us covered from the floor to the ceiling, from our alley, even to the street. This divider, this press, my cooling conveyor, my oven. Ow, ow! Ewing Levitt covers our counter stacker and our employees too. If you need insurance, take it from Little Rich at Rockalitas. Call Ewing Levitt, they'll get you covered. Go home. I strip down to my skivvies. All right, here we go. I got it. I got it. I got it. Hey, everybody. Steve Gould from Golden Moon Distillery and Golden Moon Speakeasy. When I get my cocktails to go from Golden Moon Speakeasy, I go home, I kick back, and I watch the modern eater. Skivvies. Hey, I'm a Marine. It's skivvies, man.